Hi everyone, my name is Holly. I'm actually currently sitting out in my living room, so it's probably a bit echoey, but the sunlight was so beautiful. And what I want to do for this video today might seem dull to some people, so I thought dramatic lighting might make it a little more interesting. <laughs> so a little while ago, Ariel Bassett posted this video about essays and how we put so much energy and time and devotion into writing them for a single person to read, and then they just die. I wrote a lot of essays for my uh, university career. If you had asked me then, back in university, whether I liked essays, I would have laughed in your face. Uh, but I actually did, and even then, I did a little bit. I hated the deadline. I enjoyed getting an essay topic that I found very intriguing and going down this research hole and then being able to come together with all these ideas and everything I'm learned and piecing it together like a puzzle. And it felt like weaving things together and I loved when it came together beautifully. And you just had this aha moment and suddenly your argument makes sense and you actually know what you're arguing. <laughs> and I kind of miss writing essays. And I really, really like this idea of sitting here and reading one of my own essays to you guys. So I went through and tried to find as many of my old essays as I could. Some of them are on my old laptop. Most of my essays are on my old, old laptop and it doesn't work. The battery no longer works, so it's just a plug-in kind of laptop now, and the fan is going, so I can only have it on for a few minutes. And I know the second that I boot it up, it's going to want to do all sorts of updates, so it's going to take a very long time to get those essays out of there, but I went through the ones that I do have access to, and took out the ones that are like 10, 13 pages plus long, and have now in front of me a selection of shorter essays, so I thought I'd just start with one that I was pretty proud of at the time, especially because I got halfway through writing it when I realized that my argument made no sense and I had to start over and argue it the other way, even though it went against everything I wanted to do with this paper and it hurt. This was a paper that I wrote for a Canadian literature course that I had to take and didn't want to take and ended up loving. So this paper is about Pauline Johnson, which is a Canadian Native American author um, and poet. And she used to do these performances for people and have these poems and recite them in combination to people. It was a performance piece. I wanted to be on her side, but as I went down the research hole, as my paper will show, that wasn't the case. So the title of this paper was Pauline Johnson should get a gold star for trying because that meme was huge when I wrote this paper and my TA loved the title. I swear I got a little, you know, some brownie points there. So I'm just gonna read it and I don't care if anyone watches this, I'm proud of it. And bear in mind, this is a f like several years ago. I have, I'm like kind of nervous that like at the time I thought this was a great paper and I'm looking back I'm like, oh, what if it's not as good as I thought it was? Before I begin, I just wanna make a couple of notes. I do use the word Indian um, because at the time that's what was used and it is used in the titles and in the content of some of her poetry and is used to describe, in her own words, her um, outfits for her performances. So for the sake of just saying this with some flow, I'm not going to mention my sources. I am going to list them below, and I think I'm gonna try and create a document that I can share so you guys can see like where everything, the sources, and et cetera, should be. Pauline Johnson's performances and her poetry are often interpreted through a racial lens due to the indigenous content she wrote and her half-Mohawk identity. Most interpretations of Johnson's work focus on one particular question. That is, whether Johnson is complicit in upholding negative stereotypes of indigenous people or whether she subverts them through her performances. In order to consider this question, it is important to explore how the text of her poems and the nature of her performances work together in order to create meaning. In doing so, it becomes evident that while Johnson may not have intended to uphold negative stereotypes of Native people, it is the ultimate outcome of her performances. Pauline Johnson's performances and poetry work together to ultimately uphold negative stereotypes about Native people, despite her intention to subvert those negative stereotypes. Pauline Johnson's first public performance was in 1892, when she performed at an event hosted by Frank Lee for the Young Men's Liberal Club in Toronto. She was a success and was even called to do an encore, and her performance career took off after this event. As she began touring, Johnson decided to go further with her performance by adding in costumes in order to increase the dramatic flair. She decided to wear an Indian costume while reciting her Indigenous poems. Then, after intermission, she would come out in her Victorian costume to recite her nature poems. Before getting into more detail about the interpretations of these costumes, it is important to take a moment to ensure that costume is the correct term to use in regard to what Johnson wore to recite her indigenous poems. 
while regalia is typically observed to be the correct term to use rather than costume. In the case of Johnson, it is relevant to continue to use the term costume. This is because Johnson was consciously using both the Indian garb and the Victorian style evening dress as costumes to depict two different characters, or more accurately, two different reflections of the same character. Pauline Johnson on the stage should be considered a character or persona different from Johnson the person. Both outfits were deliberately meant to be costumes in order to reflect Johnson's dual identity. Johnson began her performance on stage dressed in a costume of her design that depicted a rather stereotypical native person. Sugars and Moss described the Indian costume. She attached her grandmother's silver brooches to the neckline and hung rabbit skins for the front and sleeves. Around her waist, her father's hunting knife, an Iroquois wampum belt, and a Huron scalp that had belonged to her grandfather. Later, she added a feather to her hair and a necklace of bear claws. Her Indian costume was an amalgamation of pieces from multiple indigenous cultures, which only enforces the stereotype that indigenous peoples are from a homogenous culture. This notion of a homogenous culture is something that Johnson opposed, as mentioned in A Strong Race Opinion on The Indian Girl in the Modern Fiction. Johnson explains her displeasure with the way the indigenous women are written in fiction and complains of the tendency for authors to be under the impression that such a thing as tribal distinction does not exist among the North American Aborigines. In this case, her Indian costume is interpreted as upholding indigenous stereotypes as it reinforces the stereotype of a homogenous indigenous culture. In consideration of the costume change, the sequence of that costume change is in itself relevant. Johnson went from the stereotypical Indian to the stereotypical Victorian woman, and the sequence is critiqued as being an enactment of assimilation. That is, by starting the performance in her Indian costume and changing into her Victorian costume, Johnson depicted the assimilation and disappearance of native peoples that was promoted during her time and that she opposed. Her performance, while reciting her indigenous poems, was described to include war whoops and threatening postures that evoked an image of native savagery. And then she would switch into an evening gown, hair pinned, and her manner calm, which has been interpreted as a dramatic underscore, toward the idea that her performance is an enactment of the successful assimilation of an indigenous person. This too is an example of how Johnson's performances can be interpreted as upholding negative stereotypes about native people, as it suggests that assimilation is a valid end result for native people. In regard to the poems themselves, the content and form can be interpreted to also play a part in creating meaning, just as is evident with Johnson's performance persona and costume. Johnson's poem, A Cry from an Indian Wife, is from the perspective of the wife of a warrior that is on his way to fight alongside Louis Riel for the Métis. The poem is written in a British form of poetry that includes dramatic monologues written in heroic couplets. It is regarded as one of her Indian poems and is critiqued as further evidence that she is an acting assimilation. The use of a European form filled with indigenous content is suggested to be evidence of native assimilation as it follows a European style instead of one that is of indigenous origin. This is criticized as an example of a native person assimilating to European customs and as such is another instance of Johnson's likely unintentional promotion of assimilation and so further upholds negative stereotypes of native people. It is once the contents of the poems themselves are examined, however, that Johnson's true intentions are more visible. Johnson opposed the negative stereotypes of native people that were prevalent and was concerned about the future of the indigenous population in Canada. For example, she wrote about her concerns in regard to the way that indigenous women were written in fiction. As well, the entire first half of Johnson's performance was dedicated to the recital of her indigenous poems. Johnson's poem, The Corn Husker, tells of an elderly indigenous woman whose thoughts are with the days gone by, ere might justice banish from their lands, her people that today unheeded lie, like the dead husks that rustle through her hands. While the form is, again, of European style and the content is indigenous, it is not prudent to suggest that her indigenous poems completely capture the essence of assimilation when the content alone is considered. The content of the Cornhusker is instead more accusatory toward the white Euro-Canadian population and demands attention to be paid to the native population. In Johnson's poem, A Cry from an Indian Wife, the wife of the warrior states that her husband should go forth nor bend to greed of white men's hands. By right, by birth, we Indians own these lands. Though starved, crushed, plundered, lies our nation low. Again, this is not consistent with the notion of assimilation. 
These lines directly confront the white Euro-Canadian audience with the problems that native people within Canada face. While these poems are politically charged, and Johnson clearly attempts to pass her message on to her audience through these poems, the effects that would otherwise subvert negative stereotypes about native people are overshadowed by the format of the poem, the costumes, and the sequence of her performance. Regardless of her intentions, the effect is that Johnson's performances still point toward her ultimately upholding negative stereotypes of native people. Separate from her performance, the content of Johnson's poems do indicate an intention to subvert negative stereotypes of native people. Johnson's position within her society, however, did not leave her with much agency to express her message. As a woman in society where women did not hold an equal position to men in general, her position as a poet in particular was tenuous, and she was not taken as seriously as contemporary male poets, as is evident by her exclusion from the group called the Confederation Poets. As well as being female, Johnson's race also limited her agency, considered to be non-white due to her half-Mohawk status, in a time when native peoples were seen as lower status than the Euro-Canadian population, and when assimilation was expected. Even with the Aboriginal members of the Six Nations Reserve, her agency was limited within that community due to her family's societal status. The tenuous position of Johnson's racial background and gender limited her agency within her society and her dependence on the income of her performances severely limited her agency as well. After Johnson's father died, her family fell into financial constraints, and it was during this time that she turned to make money through her writing. Eventually, her performance career was what sustained her financially, and so this too limited her agency in regard to what the overall content of her performances would include. Since Johnson was financially dependent on her performances, she was required to cater to the expectations of her audience. This meant that in order to maintain interest, Johnson had to add dramatic flair to her performance, as is evident by her inclusion of costumes. As well, she needed to provide content that was agreeable to white audiences. She did the best that she could under the circumstances of her limited agency, and did still include her politically charged indigenous poems. However, she hid them under a layer of dramatic flair, and alongside more agreeable nature poetry, in order to make her performances less controversial, so as to be able to continue to tour. While Johnson's intentions were noble in their pursuit to subvert negative stereotypes about Native peoples, Ultimately, her performances can be interpreted to have done the opposite and instead uphold negative stereotypes. Regardless of Pauline Johnson's intentions to subvert negative stereotypes of Native people, the ultimate result is that everything that covers up the content of her Indigenous poems works to reinforce and uphold negative stereotypes of Native people. The costumes utilized in her performance, the sequence of the costume changes, the combination of form and the indigenous content of her poems all combine together to invert her original intentions to subvert negative stereotypes, so that instead it appears that she upholds those same negative stereotypes. It is possible that some audience members may have been able to look beyond the dramatic cover-up layered over top of her indigenous poems in order to reflect on the messages that Johnson attempted to convey with those poems. However, it would be just as easy for audiences to instead see the process of assimilation enacted perfectly on stage and see it as further evidence that all stereotypes about Native people are true. Johnson's lack of agency must be taken into account for the reason that her performances ultimately uphold negative stereotypes of Native people, despite her intention to do the opposite. So, I hope that wasn't terribly boring, and I know it was long, but this is actually one of my shorter essays, so hopefully it's okay. So it's super weird reading my old essay, because I was actually remembering writing it. I remember looking at all these points, and trying to find an argument against them and not being able to, and eventually, in order to create a stronger essay, having to switch my argument around. It came out better for it, and I remember wanting to include so much more <laughs> to explain this and justify it and examine it, and it had to be a seven-page essay. I think it was like five to seven pages, and I always like maxed out my essays. <laughs> and I'm reading it, and I'm finding typos, and... This was my good copy. <laughs> Thank you to anyone that actually made it to the end of this video. I know it's not what I normally do. It's probably, perhaps, not something I'll do again, but I kind of really enjoyed it and sharing this. Even though as I was reading, there were things I was like, oh, I would change that now, or uh, I would restructure that sentence, or having thoughts about where I could take another argument or further this argument. But as it was in about 2015, I think, when I wrote this, this was a good essay, and I'm still very proud of it. This essay in particular I'm proud of because it was one of my first like big English essays. Uh, the beginning half of my university career, I did all history and other humanities essays, but they weren't an examination of a text like from my own thoughts. It was a lot of research and things like that, a lot of secondary sources. So for 
it being my first time really examining something myself and finding an argument, I am still pretty proud of it. Again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.